historically, there was a, a massive quantity of phosphogypsum generated as historic waste from phos acid production that happened on Palaborwa. All of the rare earths that were contained in the ore reported to the gypsum that is now sitting there as, as mine waste. The Rainbow Rare Earths Project and the Palaborwa Project is going to reclaim all of that phosphogypsum. There's about 35 million tons of it sitting on stacks there in Palaborwa. We're going to extract the rare earth elements. We're going to produce separated rare earth oxides that can go into end users and, and, and end use manufacturing, such as, such as magnets, permanent magnets being, being one of the big uses. Um, the process development is currently happening in the Rainbow Lab um, here in Randburg. Um, and we've been able to, to make immense strides over the course of the last year or so. Um, in process development, optimizing our reagent consumption, nailing down the flow sheet. And what we're currently busy doing is we are scaling up. So we've started running a pilot plant here in Randburg in this facility. Um, and the aim of the pilot plant will be to nail down a couple of final design parameters, proof to the world uh, categorically that this process works and works well, and that we can economically make this process work. And it's also going to produce a a certain quantity of feed material that can go into, into downstream further refinement. And we hope to be, to be publishing a definitive feasibility study in 2026, showcasing this, this process, after which we'd like to go into full-scale construction as fast as we can. So the rare earths is a group of elements on the periodic table. It's usually those last two lines on the periodic table that the chemistry students at school always cut off. It's, it's elements that are difficult to pronounce and not often heard of. Two of the main ones that we are going to be focusing on making a pure rare earth oxide of is neodymium and praseodymium. So those two elements, they're considered light rare earth elements, and they go primarily into the manufacture of permanent magnets. Now, permanent magnets is basically what is driving green technology revolution. It's driving the production of electric vehicles, of wind turbines for power generation. So it's used in a wide variety of applications. So those are, those are two of the, the most important ones that we're looking at. Uh, we're also looking at, at all of the heavy rare earth elements. So like I said, there's about 16 of these rare earth elements. Dysprosium and terbium, they're two of the target ones that, that we'll be producing as well in the form of a heavy, rich, mixed rare earth oxide or, or carbonate at the end of the final refining stage. Uh, the aim of that will be to go forward into, into separation of these elements as individual oxides. Um, other rare earths that there are, I can, I can name you all of them, but lanthanum and cerium in any rare earth project, they're the most of the rare earths in that ore body comprises of lanthanum and cerium. And so our, our aim would be to separate these two elements from the rest of the more valuable ones. But there certainly is a market for lanthanum and cerium if you can get them pure enough. The rest of the heavy rare earth elements include elements like samarium, europium, gadolinium. Uh, interestingly enough, gadolinium, if you go for an MRI, they inject you with gadolinium because it increases the contrast under a magnetic field of all of your organs and, and bones and things. And so at the moment, those, those rare earth elements are driving to a large extent a lot of the technology um, and market space in, like I would say, I would almost call it in modern technology. They, they're used for lasers, optics, internet, fiber, you know, cables. They're used in radar imaging. And, and like I say, there's a lot of medical, uh, medical applications for these as well. But by and large, the, the two most economically important ones for us, and I think for any rare earth project at the moment, is neodymium and praseodymium. And we have a comparatively high fraction of that in our ore. We're sitting at close to 30% of neodymium and praseodymium of the whole rare earth basket. And that's, that's quite significantly higher than what you would see in most typical rare earth, rare earth projects at mine. So that, I think, positions us uh, in a very good space to to supply the Western world of these critical rare earth elements. So part of our project will be to, to reclaim these stacks. And in doing that, we will clean up and rehabilitate that environment uh, completely. So the aim is to reclaim that, that gypsum. Once we've processed it, it will return to a modern regulatory compliant uh, line stack. It will be isolated from the environment completely. 
Um, and then systematically, that gypsum is actually something that can be used in the construction industry and in the, fer and in the uh, mining and agriculture industry. It's not fertilizer as we know of fertilizer plants, but it can be, and it is, mixed into ground and soil to provide things like phosphates and sulfates to, to plants and they apparently they like that a lot. So currently there's a fraction of that gypsum that is going into the local agri uh, sector but, but we'd be looking to actually sell off all of that gypsum. Our process design is to treat 2.2 million tons per annum of this gypsum. Our resource is 35 million tons and we've been continuously updating that resource but we're going to be treating that those two phosphor gypsum stacks standing at Pilabova over the course of 17 years. So once we start production, it should be about 17 years until we're all done. Yttrium is, is now a, a rare earth element that is always included in this rare earth basket. But if you look at the, at the chemical molar masses of the rare earths, it's always classified as the total rare earth elements or total rare earth oxides plus yttrium. So yttrium, it's there and it's considered as one of the rare earth elements, but it is slightly different. Now, Luckily, we have a substantial chunk of our total rare earth basket that comprises yttrium. Now, yttrium, it's possible to separate and isolate and purify yttrium on its own during that downstream refining step. And that's fully what we aim to do and tap out all of the, all of the value out of that spe one specific element uh, that we possibly can. Our project has none of the traditional cost associated with mining, blasting, crushing, milling. If you look at traditional, and they call them hard rock phosphate type rare earth ores, is they are hard. Our process takes a already cracked rare earth host feed material, so we don't have to mine for it, dig for it, blast, grind, crush, float. We don't have to do any of that stuff. So already we are starting a couple of steps ahead. The reason why, why many Western and as we call them, you know, igneous or hard rock phosphate type rare earth deposits are so expensive to exploit is because the mineral is what they call very refractory to normal atmospheric and ambient temperature and condition leaching. Um, so one of the first steps always after crushing, milling and flotation is to crack this rare earth mineral and that typically requires incredible quantities of reagents and energy. So you can do that in one of several ways, but you always need either a lot of acid or a lot of an alkali called caustic sodium hydroxide. Now we, we come into the picture and our process comes into the picture way after that. The fact that other parties, Sassol and, and others, have been operating that phos acid plant for so many decades, that has actually cracked this rare earth ore that they actually dug out of the ground to get to the phosphate. They've cracked those rare earth minerals for us already. So the rare earths are sitting there in the stacks at high quantity, high concentrations, in a form that is readily leachable in conditions that are not so extreme as, uh, as you find in normal rare earth processes. Um, so the fact that the resource is above ground increases the confidence that we have in our resource estimates. There's always a measure of uncertainty. And with us, we fly with a drone around the stacks. We do density measurements and we do a survey of the volume of those stacks and we have to a very, very high confidence exactly how much rare earths and how much material there is. Easily reclaimable, you know, so it's not, you don't have to go in there with massive tippers and haul trucks or anything. It's going to be much smaller equipment, much smaller, less, less environmentally hazardous, less hazardous to the people working there. And, and like I said, it's going to be a big environmental cleanup. So a big big plus factors on, on all fronts. But to a large extent now we're doing some optimization trade-offs, you know, where do we get our reagents from, um, how is it brought to site, should we put up reagent plants on site to make our own, or should we buy or, or truck in uh, reagents from a, from a supplier that is already existing. So, so it's those types of things that we're looking at. We're looking at water and energy balances and, you know, the size of ponds or the size of tanks and things like that. Um, but by and large, I think we've got at the moment a very, very the high level of confidence in the in the process and in the flow sheet and indeed we wouldn't have gone into piloting had we not had we not on the bench scale done so much work to verify this process so we've been doing these kinds of lab optimizations and that's guided the design and the construction of the pilot plant the results from this pilot plant will will guide design and trade-offs and in the during the course of 2026 we will have a dfs 